So this is an update on the greenhouse. It's now January. Uh, we had some problems and I'll show you what I did to work them out. If you watched the original greenhouse video, you had seen how everything was built. And you'll notice that here, I originally had two barrel filters. They weren't doing what I wanted. So we've replaced that. Um, I'll get more into the this here. As far as the greenhouse, there's not many changes. As you see, I've been doing some work here. Uh, we have put in a small electrical heater. This will keep the temperature in here about 10 degrees above the outside temperature. So as long as the temperature does not fall below uh, 1 degree Celsius, it's okay in here. But we do have nights where we go down to negative 7, negative 10. When that happens, I kick in the 8 kilowatt uh, diesel heater. It doesn't really do a lot. I don't know what the big hype about these are. They burn a lot of fuel. And even on the lowest setting, just for a 12-hour stint overnight, 10, 12 hours, it'll burn almost 2.5 to 3 liters of fuel on the lowest setting. I do not find it economical, especially with the way that gas prices are today. However, on really cold nights, it does do it because I cannot run any more electricity in here. Otherwise, it blows the fuses. So this was my alternative. And what happens is I've got a cable that runs along here, and that is a 12-volt charger. So the charger will charge the battery. The battery runs the uh, heater. So when this is turned off in the day, the battery's recharging. Then it burns it at night if the temperature drops. If the temperature does not drop, I don't use it, and that simply gets unplugged and the battery stays charged. And that's about the only real change in here. Uh, we put in the uh, citrus. We have a citrus and an avocado tree going in here. Uh, the peppers are about down to the last. I've already started sprouts for the sugar beet seeds. This will be their second year. These will get turned into seeds and get dropped down into here for natural uh, seeding. A lot of this we found it was getting really wet in here due to the humidity. And that's where we get into the green, into the tank. The uh, tank I had open and because the water temperature in here stays between 27.5 and 28 Celsius, the outside temperature here is always colder. I mean, the max it'll get in here is about 25, uh, 20, even on, a, even on a sunny day with the heater running in the winter. So we build a lot of moisture and condensation. I've had some problems with this also with the wood, but we managed to reduce it dramatically by, I took a piece of cover of the plastic that we used for the walls and I made a cover. And this rolls on and off. So when I go in to feed the fish in the afternoon, it rolls back, I can do my cleaning, whatever, and then it rolls back over. And it dramatically reduces the condensation by a good 50%. But you'll see even here, where it's still, it'll still build up because I've got to have some opening for it to, to vent. So that was one change. Another change was my heating unit was getting clogged up. So I put in a pool sand filter and pump. Instead of uh, sand in the filter system, I bought a bunch of the uh, foam filtering. And I have coarse, medium, fine foam filtering in here. And I have to clean this about once a month. The fil I put a filter in this, it's supposed to be a leaf catch, but I put a filter in it, and that gets cleaned twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays. The pool gets uh, cleaned on Wednesdays, and a slight vacuum on Sundays. 
And this was the, uh, the best investment that I did out of the whole thing. I really like this. It's worked out really well. It was a pond filter system with a UV on it. The UV has dramatically reduced any of my algae uh, blooms and so on. Really love it. The thing I did not like about this was the original uh, filters that came with this were little slide on things. You'd slide them onto these and then it would set inside. And it was filtering, but after about three or four weeks of pulling it out to clean it, the material, uh, let me see if I can find some here, something about like this that was blue and, and green, uh, orange and green, it just started deteriorating. And so I changed that and what I did was put in a layered system. The white or uh, their um, laundry bags stuffed with a very fine filter uh, medium. These are medium and different thicknesses. So the water will come in as you see and it picks up the majority of the large stuff, filters out, comes through, and by the time it reaches this area over here, it is almost 99% clear again. I have to clean this once a week. It gets cleaned on Sundays. And uh, it takes maybe an hour to clean the whole thing. If I do a complete clean where I will drain everything out. Come on, why are you not? There we go. There's also a, a release spigot here. So once I get everything out, I can literally drain the residue out of the bottom. It makes cleaning very simple. This comes off here and I can clean in there. This comes off, I can run a, a hose. I've got a, a, a line runner for a cable with a brush on it. Now run that through and then just pull it through and it'll clean it and I do that once a month. So the hoses get cleaned once a month. This gets cleaned once a week. The inside here gets vacuumed out and cleaned twice a week. And for that, I got a little uh, pool vacuum. It's an Intex. Uh, the thing I do not like about it is you cannot change the battery. But it's charged. It takes about uh, 48 hours to charge. The charge lasts for about 45 minutes, which is about long enough for me to get done what I need to get done but I took off the uh, the end down here so let me get this off and it's just the the very fine little net and this way I can just suck it straight up off the bottom I clean it off uh, the little nozzle doesn't get clogged up with any stones, snails, and so on. And then after I clean it into a uh, wash bucket, I let it settle, and then I can pull all the snails and stuff back out that it sucked up. It's a pretty strong little vacuum, uh, but doing it this way, I find I'm not sucking in a lot of my uh, small guppies or anything, and it works really well. So let's get this unrolled and I will show you, or get this rolled up and I'll show you. I've got just a couple little, uh, these you can pop on and off. They're not like the permanent zip strips. They're, you can use them multiple times, so I use those for clasps. Let me get this off and I'll be right back. So here we have the end pump. I've got it covered so it doesn't suck in a lot of the uh, duck kraut and so on. And it makes it easier to clean. It gets cleaned again once a week when I clean the, uh, when I clean the, the main filter. But it pumps it in, runs it down, up into the uh, ultraviolet, and then into the tank, 
and then comes out. Simple enough. You'll see the little bobbers, the swimming bobbers I've got. Those are attached to forks. And what I do when I'm feeding the fish, like here, I've got a little piece of meat on here. I can, uh, the fork will drop it down into it. And it makes it just easier for me to collect them up the next morning. And this is how I feed the, the fish things like um, uh, bell pepper, paprika, uh, cucumber, things that normally would float. I stick them onto the fork. It goes and I, I drill. These are stainless steel forks, so little cheapies. So they do the job. I've also, for larger stuff, I've got a um, skewer that can go into there. But you see the clarity of the water. It stays like this. Works really well. All of these are for the crayfish that are going to be coming in. Everything now is set up. I've got the... Uh, I've got bearded plecos in here. I've got two common plecos. The bearded plecos have started breeding. So every once in a while I see a little baby beardy pleco swimming around. I've got to add a little bit more wood because my larger pleco, which is hiding over there, you can see his tail right there. He goes all the way back underneath. He's hiding. Uh, I want to give, give them a little more cover over here. And also that will help keep separate the uh, crayfish from the plecos and hopefully reduce any type of predation or uh, conflict between them. We've got the plants growing. What I did is I got terracotta pots and I planted them and I got um, aquarium safe gravel. If you do not get aquarium safe gravel, which is mostly silica, then you can totally mess up your pH. And I found that out the hard way. I originally had place stones in here that were like just cement stones. Cement carries a lot of calcium. The calcium in turn was really upsetting my pH. So I had to get them out of there. Now my holding stones is all flint or feuerstein, which is a silica. There's a little bit of calcium deposits on it, but not enough to do anything. And it's kept my uh, pH relative between... 6.5 and 7.0, which is optimum for the fish that I've gotten here, the guppies, the uh, plecos, and so on, and will be fine for the um, Australian red claws when they come in. So we're taking care of the plants, all of that's growing. Over here is the heating system. I've got a backflow valve because I found when the water cut off, it would just come draining back one way or the other so I needed a backflow valve so that's on there this the sponge end simply pops on and off and I have a spare which is right here it's just a chunk of the medium I have a hole cut in it it slides over it and the uh, pipe that extends out of there I've drilled six uh, 10 millimeter or 1 centimeter diameter holes in it so it sucks it from all directions and so not oh, one, one hole is not getting clogged up when the pump stops the backflow stops nothing feeds out it retains the water in the hose so in here you'll see that little black line right there that's the thermostat and it runs along with the uh, hose see it here so this is all my electrical all the electrical comes in from underneath here it runs outside underground back up that one runs all the way around that's for my uh, pump to pump in uh, the rainwater and so on when I do water changes the rest of it comes down goes under the gravel and everything and comes back up to here you can see where it comes out from underneath there that white and in here is where I have my electrical setup this runs continuously this is where it runs from 
It's a 13,500 amp uh, with a resistor and reset. One plug runs to the thermostat. This is a thermostat that turns the um, turns the power on and off based on temperature, not time. So currently this is set to turn uh, when it reaches 27.5 Celsius it will turn the pump on which is what you see here. When it reaches 28 Celsius it turns the pump off. So like right now it's 27.6 so the pump is now running and it will run in, pump through, it goes through that, it goes through that filter over there, out through, around, through this filter, through this filter, and then into my heating unit, which goes around to the other side, and comes out here. So I've got this that runs continuously for air, I've got this that will also oxygenate the water. Added to that, I have an air pump where one goes over there. You can see the little water bubbling underneath. And another one that comes over here. And these are just round balls. I found that the long ones don't work that well. They'll get flipped over. The fish will knock them. They'll scoot underneath them. The round balls work better. And if you need to clean those, you soak them in vinegar and Clorox. And I have a little pump in the house that runs the air through, so as it cleans it, it pushes it all out. And that's how I clean them every few months. So that took care of the heating, it took care of the filtering, it took care of the water heating, and all of that. The one problem that we did still have was crayfish. Crayfish like octopus, are escape artists and it's not that they're I don't think that they're it's that they're so intelligent it's just that they are uh, what would be the term uh, relentless okay they always head toward water flow so they would try to come up hit the water they would literally could climb even these although they're a little slippery from the uh, the algae and so on they can climb these things and they would climb up and go right out because here you'll see there's a, a lip underneath here and they could, they could literally just crawl right up the, the hoses and right out. So I took some aluminum and made a, a little foldy shelf so that uh, they can't do that. And so that is it. This is fully operational. We have it 100% running. It's been going for six or seven months now. And you see the clarity of the water and everything. The pH is balanced 6.5 to 7. Um, the nitrates and so on are doing okay because of the plants that I put in. You'll notice I have a lot of floating plants. And the floating plants is because my little potted plants underneath, like that one over there, they may not survive the crayfish. Crayfish love eating plants and they'll gobble them up. There's one of the little plecos right there. It's one of the babies hanging on right there. And, uh, I do occasionally put the uh, almond leaves in. I find that that's better than adding all the additives and stuff. Just two little almond leaves, or those extra large almond leaves, let them do their business. The crayfish eventually, of course, will eat those as well once they start deteriorating. So everything now is a functioning ecosystem. There's one of my little stripies. The guppies in here will be for 
food. As they reproduce, I can scoop them out, kill them. They get ground into what we call, uh, if you do carp fishing, you have boilies. And I'll be making boilies using the, uh, the uh, duckweed, which is growing up here. This is 45% pure protein. So I can dry that, grind it up, and I just cleaned out three liters of it. So it's fairly clear right now. And I'll, as it grows back, I'll clean out more. So that's an added protein bonus. Also, it is edible by humans if you cook it properly. That gets blended in, and I make the boilies, and the boilies will go in with the, the ground carrot, uh, zucchini, and so on, uh, that will uh, help balance out their diets. So that's about it on the tank. The next stage on this will eventually be, once the house is built and the power's ran, to set up a, um, a different greenhouse for this. Because this has been the test run. Here will actually go all of my, uh, my uh, fruit trees and stuff that I want to keep that are not uh, winter tolerant. Excuse me. Uh, the trees and stuff that are not winter tolerant. And then once this is out of here, it's going to dramatically reduce the humidity issue. As you see, it's even affecting my, uh, my pineapple plant, which I do not like. But the humidity is a problem with the tank in here. So just be aware of that if you're going to go this route. I am putting this, eventually this will become a plexiglass tank. This will get cleaned and become an outside swimming pool. So no money lost. And uh, the plexiglass tank will go into an aluminum and plastic greenhouse. So I don't have to worry about the humidity affecting my wood. And so that is it for that until this is redone and moved on to the, to the new location. The greenhouse is working above ex expectation. We've still got carrots growing. We've got some uh, radishes growing. We've got lettuce growing. I'm going to put some cabbage in here. My parsley, basil, my little uh, herbs and so on are growing well. Some are taking it better than others. But it is what it is. So... That's it. This concludes everything for the greenhouse and stuff. And like I said, your, um, if you want to see the entire original construction, watch the uh, greenhouse video. And that goes how I built the whole thing step by step. And I'll let you get back to doing what you were doing, and or you can go watch another video.